Now on to formally introducing supervised learning. We looked at a data example how a data instance and training data set could possibly look like for supervised learning. Now, just formally introducing supervised learning, let's look at how these training examples can be used by the learning algorithm to learn a function f. So we have training examples on the left hand side and those are fed into the learning algorithm of your choice and that would give you an f a function and using that function now you predict y cap which is your prediction apart from your prediction you also know the true label which is y and now you have to let the algorithm learn from how it is performing so you are going to establish a loss function that captures the difference between y cap and y so recollecting our earlier discussion on representation and evaluation, connecting that into supervised learning here, we have the learning algorithm which falls into representation. So you choose a kind of learning algorithm and that is how you choose to represent the data and its relationship with the label Y and what kind of functions it can produce. So that is where the representation part fits and the loss function so you continuously have to tell the algorithm where it's performing well and where it's not performing well and that's why you need a way to measure how the algorithm is doing and that is done by your loss function and we saw different kinds of evaluation accuracy precision recall all those different um, evaluation measures fit into your loss function and l y cap comma y on the right this measures your loss and this could be L could be or any of these evaluation measures and that is used to improve the algorithm to do better and minimize the loss so at test time so this is all during train training time training time you are learning a better algorithm again and again and at test time which is the upper loop at test time you have X X is bold because X is what you know why is something you don't know at test time so at test time y is hidden from the algorithm it is only fed x and using the function it predicts y cap and the test point label y is fed into the loss function to calculate its final performance so at test time, you are no longer learning the algorithm, but you are using the learned algorithm to test it on some data. And if you happen to have the labels for the test data as well, you can use it to measure your loss or how good your performance is. And the better the performance of the algorithm at test time, the more valuable the algorithm um, on any real world task. All right. So now let's continue this discussion and now we are going to look at hypothesis spaces and um, for that we are going to take a simple problem. Let's say we have four features x1, x2, x3 and x4 and we have a target variable y and all these are boolean. Let's say all these variables can take values 0 or 1 and using these data points that you have in the slide you want to learn a function to predict y so our next question is if we know f if we can how do you come up with the right approximation for f on the left you have an unknown function f that maps x to y so that's our problem in the supervised learning setting right and you have lots of training data and examples that gives x comma f of x and you feed all the training examples to a learning algorithm and the learning algorithm learns h which is for hypothesis learns h which is a good approximation of f but can it look at all possible functions? Is it even possible to do that? 
do you or do you need a space in which the algorithm should focus on and to find your age that's a good approximation to f so hypothesis spaces come in handy where you tell the algorithm to look at a set of candidate functions or your assumptions about f that is helpful in directing in guiding the algorithm to find the right approximation h suppose we have just the data set that we showed before there are only seven data points suppose you only have that then we still have two to the nine possibilities for all the different other data set data points that we don't have so how do we determine that so let's say uh, we saw that we have four features for each of these features you can have zero or one so how many different combinations would there be two raised to four right because each of these four attributes can have either zero or one so it will have two to the four combinations of all these four attributes together so that would be 16 16 different combinations of x1 x2 x3 and x4 so that's what we have in this table here on the left we have 16 different combinations of x1 x2 x3 and x4 but we had only seven data points for other values of or other combinations of x1 x2 x3 and x4 we don't know the value of y so that's why we have a question mark there so for this y could take any value right for these nine examples so 16 minus 7 is 9 and for these nine examples for which we don't have the value of y it can take either 0 or 1 so what would that give us it would give us 2 raised to 9 possibilities for y for different combinations of y right so for example the first value of y could be 0 or 1 and the same is true for the next question mark and so on so there are two to the nine different ways in which these question marks can be filled and that gives us so many need for so many functions to to look at now scale this to a more realistic data set suppose you have a biology um, gene sequencing data set 10,000 features is actually a low number there. Suppose you have a vision data set. You want to look at different pixels. You think 10,000 features is going to cut it? These days we look at micropixels, nanopixels, and so on and so forth. And 10,000 is really a small number when it comes to what machine learning can do. So 10,000 features and even if features are binary, which is not true in the real world, and even if the output is binary, which also may not be true in the real world, even then, which is, this is a smaller side of a realistic data set, how many Boolean functions are needed? So you will see that 10,000 features, features are binary. So what are the different possible combinations, how many different possible combinations of features exist? We saw for four features, two raised to four. For 10,000 features we have 2 raised to 10,000 possible combinations right so 2 raised to 10,000 possible combinations of just the features for each of these then your output value could be 0 or 1 because we have assumed that the output is binary so if we saw that in the previous example I'm just going back to the previous slide so the previous example we saw for four features, two raised to four different combinations of the features. And for each of these, we have the y value could be zero or one. So that would give us two raised to two raised to four, which is two raised to 16, right? So that's what is there in the slide, two raised to 16 possible functions over four input features. So now for 10,000 features, even if features are binary and output is binary, we have 2 raised to 2 raised to 10,000. And that is a very big number. 
um, and you cannot possibly look at so many functions even with high performance computing all these advanced improvements we have over computing these days even then it's a big number that is why we need hypothesis spaces because hypothesis spaces tells us where to look it it tells us you don't have to consider all these two raised to two raised to ten thousand functions but look at this subset of functions and from this subset find one that best approximates your underlying function f okay so let's look at a simple example here to understand the concept of hypothesis spaces better uh, let's say we have um, we are only looking at simple rules so that is one hypothesis space so we are only looking at rules um, which have a conjunctive form and um, or just look at one each feature separately so con conjunctive forms up to the length of four so that's what we have here suppose this is our hypothesis space now we want to see if in this hypothesis space can we find a function that approximates our underlying function f it turns out for all of this there is a counterexample that exists in our data set so we had seven data points remember so that's our training data set and if this one of these functions do not fit uh, excludes one of those data points then it really does not fit the data right so we cannot consider that unfortunately none of these seem to work so no simple rule explains the data which means this hypothesis space is not ideal for this this data set 